Hi, my name is Peter. Uh, I am a junior studying business administration and also minoring in youth ministry. I am passionate about music. That's why I wanted to actually do my full-time career. I really love sports um, and also meeting new people. That's, that's kind of my thing. My name is Rachel Bovey. I am from Hyde Park, New York. I am a senior music BA and communications double major. Music has definitely always been a huge passion of mine. I play on my church's worship team back at home. I also love to play frisbee with my friends. Anytime my friends go out on like a nice sunny day and just toss around the frisbee, it makes me so happy. I kind of feel like a golden retriever is my spirit animal in that sense. My name is Nick Markham. This is my second year at Gordon. I am from the Worcester area and I am majoring in communication arts. One of my passions is videography. I absolutely love handling the camera, editing videos, and creating content that people will love. My name is Quentin Cole. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm a communication arts major and a poli-sci minor. One of my passions is piano. I've been playing for 12 years. Uh, it's one of my favorite hobbies, and I just like to sit down every day. Since the beginning of this semester, I've been co-president of the Rock Gym. Every week, we set up open gym hours, and we get to let people climb and do adventure kind of things. My name is Sophia Jeans. I'm from Candia, New Hampshire. I'm a senior, and I'm a triple major in psychology, theater arts, and communication arts. I'm super passionate about the power of the individual story, and then how, when those are shared, they can bring people together through kind of finding those similar threads in other people's stories. One of the things I really have enjoyed doing is the participation in Gordon's theater productions here and coming together and working collaboratively with other artists to tell a larger story um, has been one of my most favorite things. The Judd Talks are a competition at Gordon similar to a TED Talk style format. Um, everyone submits an audition video on a topic of their choice. They're meant to be inspirational, it's kind of a student taking an idea that they have and a belief or kind of a thread of thought and then expounding upon it. It's a really special time where we get a, a platform to be able to address the college and address you know, whoever is watching on a topic that is really important to us, something that we're passionate about. I want to try to get out of my comfort zone, right? And uh, get to the point where I'm comfortable in front of people. I'm most excited just about the opportunity to speak to be able to present myself on a public platform. I, I haven't grown up with much experience speaking on a public platform. It's not the easiest thing for me to do, yet I want to step out of my own comfort zone and out of my own boundaries. What I'm most nervous about is being prepared for the talk because it generally takes me a long time to prepare for what I want to talk about. So with these Judd Talks, I have to take time, meet with people, and practice and practice over and over and over again to be comfortable with that. Um, I'm most excited about just the experience and getting more knowledge of public speaking and presenting uh, under my belt, and I'm most nervous about the presenting and public speaking. I'm a little bit nervous about what what it'll feel like to be recording a Judd talk. Public speaking to a camera is always a really weird experience, but I think that it's a good place to grow. I'll say I'm excited about really talking about things that I'm passionate about as well, and bring some sort of solution, I guess, to the problem that's around the world. Public speaking has always been interesting for me because it's something that I love to do. I actually love to speak in front of people. I think also part, part of me being a musician, like a singer and playing the flute, I'm very used to being in front of people and performing, but there's always a small part of me that does get anxious and does get like nervous about that. It's never to the point where it stops me from being okay being in front of an audience. So like there's a little bit of that, um, like there's a lot of energy and excitement that comes from performing or like speaking in front of people. I'm really excited to hear what everyone else pulls together and the brain children of my peers and what they've been thinking about, dreaming about, uh, how they kind of want to change their own small corner of the world. I just think it's so cool how we all have this, um, you know, we're all part of the same competition. And even though we, we are in competition with one another, it's really a cool time to get to see what other students are passionate about and get to see their own personalities come out from their through their speeches. So I'm definitely excited to support and watch my other um, fellow contestants as they give their speeches. No matter who gets first or second or third or any place, all the speeches will matter 
and they'll all make an impact. I'm just excited to compete and see what happens. <laughs> Enjoy, um, and please listen to other what other people have to say as well. And yeah, see you guys soon. <laughs> Welcome everyone. I am Dr. Christy Gardner. I am Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Communication Arts, Theater and Art at Gordon College. And I'm so pleased to welcome you tonight to the 2021 Adoniram Judson Gordon Memorial Speech Competition, the Jed Talks. The Jed Talks are a TED style speaking competition that is named after our founder, A.J. Gordon, and it is in his honor that we are speaking tonight. As a pastor, as an educator, as a liberal arts college graduate, as a hymn composer, A.J. Gordon knew the power of words to communicate the good news of the gospel. And that's what we are celebrating and honoring here tonight. So tonight you will be hearing from five of our exceptional student speakers. All of them have had to audition to be here tonight for our finals. Myself and my communication arts colleague, Dr. Dr. Rachel Yu, and I were both adjudicating those first rounds. We'll be hearing from Dr. Yu later on in our program tonight. Uh, so this is the finals, and the students were tasked with crafting an eight to 10 minute speech that inspires, motivates, and challenges the Gordon College community. That's what we're gathered here for tonight. Now, this is a speech competition, so just to remind the students tonight, if they need reminding, uh, there is cash on the table for this thing. So first place will be winning $300, second place $200, third place $100, and we do have a panel of guest judges who will be making those decisions for us tonight. So let me just pause and introduce those judges to you. Our first judge is Sam Flores. Sam is a 2019 graduate of Gordon College with two degrees in English literature and philosophy. Sam has the distinction of being part of that very first cohort of our Jed Talks. He was one of our finalists sitting where our speakers are sitting tonight. Uh, Sam works as an implementation specialist at EBSCO Information Services in Ipswich. Our second judge is Shalita Francis. Shalita is a 2018 graduate of Gordon, communication arts major, and Shalita works as a communication and marketing specialist at the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute in George Dorchester, Massachusetts. And for our third judge, Rebecca Manazian. She is a 2018 alum of the college, two degrees, communication arts, theater arts, and she's currently in graduate school working on a comedy screenwriting degree at Falmouth University. We're so grateful for our judges. Thanks judges for participating in our event tonight. Now you may have noticed things are a little bit different tonight. Um, we are here in McDonald Auditorium in the Ken Olson Science Center at Gordon College, but it feels a little lonely and cavernous. Typically we would have these seats filled, but of course this little thing called a pandemic is changing those things a bit, but we are grateful for communication technology that allows us to join you wherever you are tonight. And we are abiding by the COVID regulations on the campus. So I am able to be without a mask here because everyone is way, way back in the back of the auditorium. But we hope that you are being safe wherever you are gathered tonight to watch this event. Okay, one more thing um, I need to mention before we get started. There is actually a fourth judge that I need to introduce, and that fourth judge is you, our audience. There is a fourth award for tonight. It's the People's Choice Award. And we invite all of you to listen carefully and intensely to the speeches tonight and select your favorite speech. There will be a link in the chat. You can check it out at the end of this event. It'll be open for about 10, 15 minutes for you to cast your vote for that speech that you think best inspires and motivates and challenges the Gordon College community. And then immediately following this event, I wanna invite you to join us all. I'll be there, Dr. Yu will be there, all of the contestants or judges for a live Zoom reception. That link will also be in the chat. And that's when we'll be announcing the first, second, third place winners. We'll have the big reveal for the People's Choice Award. 
Uh, so be sure to stop by immediately following this event. Okay. I think that is it. Let's get on with this thing and let's get ready to be inspired and motivated. Our first speaker tonight is Rachel Bovey. She is a graduating senior, double majoring in communication arts and music, and she will be speaking to us tonight about, well, let's talk about communication. My aunt works in the public school district and she has a teacher friend who was giving a lecture to a bunch of students. And during the lecture, the topic of karma came up. Now, these students were quite young and didn't really understand what karma was. So the teacher went on to explain to them and gave a very lengthy definition of karma. And after she was done, she asked the students if they understood. One of the students raised his hand and said, yes, I hate karma, especially when it gets stuck in your teeth. So he thought karma was caramel. That's a funny example of miscommunication. Now, miscommunication happens all the time because communication happens every day. It's something that we do from birth. You know, babies cry to signal that something's wrong. But communication can come in many different forms. Language, but it's really any way that we receive or send messages. So it can be nonverbal, it could be expressive, artistic, through the arts or through media. But just because we are born with the gift of communication does not mean that we always steward it well. I think you know, the story I told in the beginning was a humorous example of miscommunication, but I'm sure we have all seen ways in which miscommunication or misuse of communication can be very harmful. So I am a communications major. So communications is very vital to my future and my career, but I am also a human. And I realize that my own communication skills are lacking at times. So I invite you tonight to join me on a journey to become a better, more effective communicator. So during my speech, we are going to look at three different areas that are critical to uh, effectively communicating. We're going to look at active listening, intentionality, and humility. So let's dive right in. All right, active listening. I will be the first to admit that this is an area that I struggle with. Talking, never been a problem. I love to talk and get a conversation going with anyone. Listening, on the other hand, well, let's just say I fall into the category of what we like to call cooperative overlap. That is just a very friendly way of saying I interrupt people when they're talking to me. I also think of my response when someone is in the middle of speaking, and so that isn't really a good active listening trait. Uh, the Gift of Life Institute has a quote that says, active listening is a conscious effort that demands empathy, effort, attention, and lots of practice. And that's very true. It is a skill that we need to develop. So I have a couple tips for becoming a better listener. Number one, you want to face the speaker. Like I said earlier, our bodies communicate a lot when we are talking. So it's important to face the speaker and make eye contact with them to show that you're listening. You also want to be attentive, but be relaxed. You want to concentrate on what they're saying. Now, if you struggle with concentration, you could try either repeating the words after they say them in your head, or even try painting a mental picture. And then last, you want to pause before responding. Now, that's really hard because it requires patience. But active listening is so, so important because we as human beings are storytellers. But that also means that we need to listen to the stories that are being told. It is how we engage and learn from the people around us. And it's how we show that what they have to say matters. All right, so next, we're going to look at intentionality. Now, have you thought about that, about how to be intentional with your communication skills? 
My father has this quote that he says, there are three things in life that you can't get back. An, an arrow when it's been dropped from a bow, time after it's gone by, and a word after it's been spoken. Now raise your hand if you've ever said something and then immediately regretted it after you've said it. It's the worst feeling. You're like, no, 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 no. You like try to get those words back, but you can't because they're out there and they're gone. Or on the flip side, there's also those moments when we didn't say something. We didn't speak up and we didn't speak out. And that can be just as harmful. Proverbs 12, 18 says, reckless words pierce like a sword, but words of the wise bring healing. That is so powerful. Words of the wise bring healing. Our communication can either be destructive or it can bring healing. What does your communication do? Are you intentional with the words and with your actions? It is so important for us to use wisdom, but also to communicate out of a place of love. And now when I talk about love, I don't mean that we avoid difficult conversations or that we avoid um, confrontation, because those are really important to have. What we communicate may change, but the way we communicate needs to remain the same. We must communicate with intentionality, use wisdom and love. All right, so lastly, I want to look at humility as it relates to effective communication. Our communication is going to fail. The story I told in the beginning is a funny story of miscommunication, but I think we can all agree that there are very harmful ways that miscommunication or misuse of communication plays out. My communication is going to fail. Yours will. We see it on the media every day. There was a study done from the University of Chicago Chronicle that shows we don't communicate nearly as well as we think we do. There was a study between uh, listeners and speakers, and about 46% of the time, there was a miscommunication error. It is so important for us to apply grace and forgiveness to ourselves and to others when our communication fails, because we're human and it's going to fail. Quinton Schultz, a communication scholar, has this quote where he says, our best communication flows from grateful hearts. The more we open our hearts to receive God's blessings, the more fully we can become servant communicators. I just love that. I think it's so beautiful being a servant communicator, looking at communication as an act of service. Because let me ask you this, why do we communicate? What is the purpose? To what end do we communicate? Communication should be collaborative, not competitive. It's two ways. God has given us the communication, the gift of communication to build relationships with one another. So today in my speech, we talked about active listening, intentionality, and humility as it relates to communication. And those are not easy to do at all. I'll be the first to admit that. And at times, it can seem hopeless. But I want to encourage you that it is not hopeless. I'll leave you with this. The Lord, master of communications, literally spoke the universe into existence. He said, let there be light. And then later on, with both his actions and his words, communicated something even more powerful when he said, it is finished. And God has given us that same gift of communication to steward well. Now we have the responsibility and the accountability to be good stewards of our communication. But I truly, truly believe that when we actively listen to one another, when we are intentional to use wisdom and love in our communication skills, and when we view communication with a heart of humility and look at it as an act of service, we are going to grow closer to the master communicator, but also we are going to build better relationships with those around us. Thank you so much.
Hi, my name is Rachel Yeo. I'm an assistant professor in communication arts at Gordon. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a second speaker. Our second speaker tonight is Quentin Cole. He is a freshman majoring in communication arts, and he's going to talk about Love Thy Neighbor. On May 30th, 2020, I made the decision to post on Instagram that I was gay. Within seconds, everyone in my youth group, in my school, and my friends and my family knew the secret that I had been keeping for over 18 years, a secret that I had been keeping for so long that it felt so freeing to finally release. That evening, I received an overwhelming amount of love and support from people in the community, comments saying things like, I'm proud of you and much love, and I went to bed that night feeling really accepted. The next morning, I woke up to a different reality. I woke up to some emails and texts, and my parents woke up to some emails and texts from families in the community that seemed to disagree. They said things like, he needs to change. He needs to go back on what he did. He needs to go back on what he said and change the choice that he made to be gay. And someone as far to say that I was going to hell. Now the conversation of love in today's society primarily centers around the LGBTQ community and this conversation of loving who we want to love. This conversation, particularly around the LGBTQ community, is something that is heavily avoided by the church. It's avoided because the church instantly jumps to this debate of whether or not being gay is a sin, this theological conversation. This talk is not meant to be that debate. This talk is meant to be a kickstart for a much larger conversation, which is a conversation on loving people that we have differences with. So why is this important? According to the Trevor Project, which is an organization that seeks to reduce suicide in LGBTQ youth, LGBTQ youth are three times as likely to contemplate suicide as heterosexual youth, and five times as likely to attempt suicide as heterosexual youth. As you can see from the chart, LGBTQ youth are twice as likely to attempt suicide when they are raised in a household that they heard religion used to speak negatively of the LGBTQ community. These statistics are shocking, and they show that in these situations where there is a lack of love, it's a matter of life or death. I am a gay Christian. I identify as a member of the LGBTQ community. But first and foremost, I identify as a child of God. I place my faith and my salvation in him. And as I said, when I came out, I received an overwhelming amount of love and support. People said, I'm here for you. You're so strong, and you have all of my support. But the next morning, as I said, some people seemed to disagree. Some people thought that this choice that I had made to be gay was something that they could change and something that they thought should change. And some people told me that I was going to hell. And some people told my best friends that I was going to hell. As time passed and I made the decision to attend Gordon College, I had a lot of people ask me, why are you going to a Christian college like Gordon when your presence there goes against the life and conduct statement at that college? And I always told them this, that Gordon is a Christian college, and because of that, I can see myself growing there, growing in my faith, growing in my relationship with God, and growing in a relationship with his people, other Christians. And then people would accept that answer and move on to the other question of, are you scared to go to Gordon? And I always wanted to save face. So I would tell people, no, I'm not scared to go to Gordon. Like I said, it's a place that I can see myself growing. But in reality, I was scared. I was terrified. I was terrified that the things that happened to me in the summer would happen at Gordon. I was scared that the same backlash and disagreement that happened over the summer would happen to me at Gordon. And this was scary because the things that happened over the summer made me question who I was. They made me question the decision that I had made to come out publicly. They made me question whether or not I could truly live as I wanted to live. So how do we as Christians effectively love members of the LGBTQ so that there is not this hurt and there is not this disagreement? Merriam-Webster defines love as an unselfish and benevolent concern for the good of another person. I want to focus on this first word, unselfish. This word unselfish insinuates the fact that love comes from a place of being lesser than. Love comes from a place of not trying to force your views and not trying to change a person. 
Psychology Today did a study on people that have disagreements, and they said when they have a conversation, people are only focused on trying to change that person's opinion and change that person's view, and they rarely focus on listening to the other person. They come from a place of, I know more than you, I'm better than you, and I'm going to fix you, and that's not working. It's not working at all, and it shows how there is this forcefulness to love, which was experienced with me and the families over the summer. So humility is important in these situations. Humility coming from a place of lesser than and coming from a place where love is truly effective in making sure that people do not feel like they are trying to be changed and they don't feel like they are trying to be fixed. The second point that I want to make is by setting expectations. How many times have I cleaned my bedroom or washed the dishes for my parents without them asking me to? And the next day I thought, oh great, I don't have to wash the dishes tonight. We're good, I did it last night and they didn't ask me to. And then you're standing there at the sink washing dishes for your parents that night. You go in with these false expectations, you see? You see you have these expectations that because I showed this person love, they're going to show me love in return. Or because I did this for them, I'm gonna get something back. And these expectations set up so much disappointment. Some people offer love and they expect, oh, this person's gonna like me back, or I'm gonna show love to this cool person and I'm gonna get something out of that. I'm gonna get recognition and status. But if that person is not ready to accept the love and with this manipulative love you're offering, that's not likely, if they're not ready to accept that, you're setting yourself up for some massive disappointment and you're setting yourself up for this lack of effective love as we're talking about. When you don't have the correct expectations for love, it's not true effective love it's if it's to manipulate or if it's to get something back from the person. Now the final point that I wanna make is seeking to understand and in my opinion, this is one of the most important points because everyone comes from a different background. Everyone has differences. And a lot of people don't look at those differences when talking to someone that they have differences with. It's ironic. When we're talking to people, we sometimes assume that they were raised in a similar way that we were. We sometimes assume that we grew up in the same type of household, or we assume that we were both raised in a Christian household or in the same wealth class. But that's not true. Everyone has a different history and no one person is the same. We are all unique. We are all individual children of God. And so a lot of people will go into conversations of love not assuming these things. Between me and the families over the summer, there was a lot of false understanding that because their kids went to the same school as I went to and because our parents went to similar types of churches, that I was similar to their kids and that I must be broken because I was different from them. And they didn't seek that understanding. We all have these differences and they have to be acknowledged, particularly when talking about the LGBTQ community. The LGBTQ community, I can speak from experience, grows up living constantly set apart from their peers. Particularly as a gay man, living as a Christian, I've lived a whole life feeling set apart from other guys, from other people at my school, hearing these conversations and never really feeling like I fit or never feeling like these conversations I was hearing at youth group applied to me because I was so different. And when people don't seek to understand where you're coming from and understand your history, effective love can't be communicated because you don't understand who you're trying to love. You don't understand where the person is coming from and why they might not be able to receive the love that you're offering or why it's hard for them to receive that love. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy and it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others and it is not self-seeking. Effective love is a process, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes a lot of energy and patience. But effective love when truly communicated using these things, these tools of humility, these tools of expectations and understanding, effective love can work miracles. Effective loves can change relationships between people, can change the relationship between people you have differences with. Now I've been talking tonight about differences between the church and the LGBTQ community, but these differences might not be just that. These differences could be a difference in race, as we've seen the past summer with the Black Lives Matter movement and the spring with the Stop Asian Hate movement. 
This could be a difference in religion. It could be loving your atheist friend or loving your Muslim friend, someone you still have these differences with. But I believe that these three tools can still be applied to those situations, these tools of humility, expectations, and understanding, because everyone has differences and we all come from different backgrounds. But when effective love is applied, effective love can change someone's life. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sophia Jeans. She is a graduating senior, triple majoring in communication arts, psychology, and theater arts. And she'll be speaking to us tonight about embracing the unknown. So there I was in the Myrna Chaz market in Moscow, Russia. My friend and I had just haggled with a woman to bring back some matryoshkas for our family in the States after our time abroad. And as we turned to leave the stalls, a man wearing a large cowboy hat came walking towards us. He threw out his hand and in a thick European accent called, hello, I would like to get to know more about you, your country, and where you're from. Now, my friend and I hesitated and rightfully so. In Russia, there were lots of scams going on, especially pitpocketing in the markets. After evaluating the situation and finding no danger at all, we called him over and began to speak with him. After talking to him for about 10 minutes, we discovered that he really did want to get to know about us and our culture. We tried to navigate the language barrier and eventually he looked at us before he left and said, I may not know you and you may not know me or wholly understand each other, but what I do know is that we are all people on adventures through that which we don't know to become better and make the world a better place. So what comes to mind for you when you think about the phrase, the unknown? Is it a future job, what you'll be doing in five years? Are you wondering about what post-pandemic or post-college life might be like? Does it catch you feeling uncomfortable and shifting in your seat? Or do you think of the unknown as an adventure? Many people don't like that which they don't know. We want to be prepared. I'm a graduating senior class of 2021, and I can tell you the past four years has been preparing myself for what's going to happen next. We do this through going to classes, applying for internships, taking jobs, building relationships. The very point of college is to prepare for what's next. So before Jeff Miller pitched the idea of the unknown unknown, to myself and a group of theater majors in 2019, I had never considered exploring what I didn't know intentionally. No, I was always a very go with the flow kind of person. I knew there were things I couldn't plan for and I was fine with it, but I didn't chase after them. I didn't grow because of them. I just adapted or accepted and moved on. So in a small back room of Barrington Center for the Arts in spring of 2019, Jeff Miller pitched an idea to myself and a group of other theater students. There were people on the floors, leaning against the wall, sitting on the tables and covering every possible service. As Jeff leaned in and asked one singular question, what would happen if we explored the unknown unknown? So what is the unknown unknown? As Jeff explained it, the unknown unknown has two purposes. First, it's doing something that you've never done before accepting that you have literally no expectations for what might happen or what you might be able to do. And the second part of that is knowing that you can't prepare for what might happen because of it, because that's also unknown. And I decided after participating in the Fringe Festival, which was electric every night, audiences left feeling as if they had been part of something bigger than themselves, as if they were part of an exploration of something bigger and worthwhile. This response excited me. I wanted more of it. And so I decided to let my curiosity drive me further into that which I didn't know. Now, if you're anything like me at this point, you're wondering what's the point of all of this? Following the unknown sounds like a great idea in theory, but what does it look like practically? And is there science behind it? The answer is yes. Researchers at BrainTap Technologies have identified two mindsets that an individual can have about the future. First is a fixed mindset. Now a fixed mindset is the one you want to try to avoid. It's what happens when we sit within our worries, our fears, our doubts, and we let them define how we're living. 
So for example, if you use phrases like, I can't do this, or I hate this, or this is impossible, you begin to believe it and that's what drives your life. But when you're able to catch these negative habits, forms of thinking and reactions to difficulties, you can change it to a growth mindset and move forward. So instead of saying, this is impossible and I'll never be able to do it, you take time to do it and you recognize that even if you fail, you can improve and move on. And that very simple catching yourself in those moments of negativity and moving towards growth can change your life. And to go along with this, there are two very practical steps that you can take in your daily lives. The first thing I would suggest is that you schedule time to just have adventure time. And by this I mean have a weekend or a couple of hours in the middle of your week where you block out time with no specific plan except to follow curiosity. So maybe for you this looks like taking a train into Boston with no itinerary of where you're going to go. And instead of wondering what's down the street to the left, go down the street to the left and discover what might be there. Or it means saying yes to getting coffee with someone new and opening the door to a potential new relationship. Creating these opportunities for you to say yes with positive associations and rewards is key in moving towards a growth mindset. Now the second step into the unknown, it's very key, is recognizing that it's okay to be afraid. It really is okay to not know what's going to happen and to even have a little bit of fear associated with that. But recognizing that fear and taking it and using it to provide momentum is key. So I'm not saying to go out and do something dangerous or illegal, like going 150 miles per hour on the highway. No, <laughs> what I'm saying is to take something that you're just a little bit afraid of and let that fear drive you. So for example, maybe you've always wanted to travel, but you've been afraid of what it might look like if you travel alone. Instead of wondering what other people might think of you, go anyway and frame it as investing time and energy in discovering who you are. Using this fear to constantly motivate these small steps starts to take away some of the oh no's and what ifs. Now for me, embracing the unknown meant going to Klaipeda, Lithuania in the spring of 2019 to study abroad at LCC International University. This wasn't just embracing a new country or a new culture and recognizing that I didn't speak the language, I didn't know the customs, I didn't know anyone else who was going. So I had no pre-existing relationships to sustain me while I was there. This was completely new. And if I had focused on everything that could go wrong, like getting lost in an airport, my first time traveling internationally alone, not being able to make friends, having messy or awful roommates, feeling frustrated by the gap between home and here and the time that I missed, I never would have left if I just sat with these fears and these worries and I let them drive me. But instead, I was able to use a growth mindset to recognize these fears as the best elements of a good adventure. And that's what embracing the unknown is. It's recognizing that the things that scare us will always scare us, and that's okay. But recognizing that we can choose how we respond to them, how we think about them, how we frame them, and how we act upon them. My friends and I didn't throw a pity party when we were told that we had to return to the United States because of the worldwide pandemic that was spreading. Instead, we went out in St. Petersburg, Russia and had what we called our end of the world party. We got dinner and we gathered around a large table and talked together about all the adventures we had, all the time that we spent, all the secret laughs and good things that had happened because of our steps into the unknown collectively. And on the train home from Russia to Lithuania, we spent time writing each other meaningful letters about how each individual person had played an important role in our cohort, in our lives, and in our future. These are the things that will stick with me. These are the things and the moments and the cultures and the stories and the experiences that have changed me for the rest of my life that wouldn't have happened if I didn't take small steps into the great unknown. So I want to challenge you to do the same. Face what you're afraid of. Face all the possibilities and the things that you can't control. Acknowledge them, view them as a chance to grow, and go. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So I want to challenge you. Go afraid, go joyful, go into the unknown. Thank you.
our next speaker is Peter Deho Lee. He is junior majoring in business administration and he's gonna talk about pursue the positivity. Try to picture this true story with me. It was a sunny day on a Sunday afternoon in India. Really nice weather and it was one of its kind in a tropical country as you feel the breeze, see the flowers blooming, and it was one of those rare moments when you start to appreciate the day. However, it was a very important day for this 10-year-old boy, not because he finished all his exams and was waiting in excitement for his parents to pick him up at the boarding school. Um, it was a news that he was eagerly waiting to hear from his parents, a news that could change his entire life, and an opportunity you would not want to exchange for anything because it was once in a lifetime opportunity for him. The boy sees his parents and runs in excitement, and the father happily carries his son and welcomes him into his arms, and, go back, and, and, and they're on their way back home. And they exchange in a meaningful conversation, and soon the father looks at his son and tells, son, your dream is to study in America, right? And the son replies, yes, dad, of course. And he goes on to explain all the things he wants to do when he goes there. The boy waits in anticipation what his father was going to say next. However, the father's face expression soon changed and looked at his son like he was defeated. Son, I hate to break the news, but you're not going to America. The boy heard this and his heart dropped and it felt that as if his dreams were crushed at the moment because all he worked for was for that moment. But it was crushed right at the moment, and all he could think was, what do I do now? And that boy was me. You see, life is unfair sometimes. And, but it, I, I think it's funny, because a few days later, I watched this movie, Pursuit of Happiness. And I don't know if some of you have watched this movie, uh, show of hands, but um, it's an amazing movie where uh, it's, a life, it's a true story of the life of a single father, Chris Gardner, and his son. Um, they were evicted from their apartment, and the father creates, struggles to create a better life for himself and his son, but eventually uh, he became one of the most successful entrepreneurs in America. Now, at the time, I really didn't understand what the movie was really about, but I've come to understand that this movie had really changed my perspective in the way how I saw things. So today, I want to change my title and talk about the pursuit of positivity. Here's one example that I wanted to all participate. So I want you all to look at this picture right here and think and observe what you see on this picture. What would you see and how would you describe it? Now, in a classroom full of students, it was a test day. And the students, the teacher hands them over this sheet of paper and tells them not to turn the page until further instructions were given. The students was waiting in anticipation what was it about, and the test began. And to their surprise, when they turned the page, it was a blank sheet of paper with just a dark spot in the middle. They were, utter, they were confused and startled, and they started to look at the teacher and in utter confusion. The teacher looks at them and tells them, I wanted to write a few lines about what you see on the paper. After all the answers were written, the, the teacher reads all of the answers aloud in the class. Everyone had wrote about the characteristics about this dark spot. And the teacher tells them, all of you wrote about the, about the dark spot, but none of you wrote about the white part of the paper. You see, similar things happen in our lives too. When things happen, we focus on the dark spots and we give them more power than we should by limiting our vision, such as, you know, by limiting our, uh, these dark spots can be our fears, our anxieties, um, people that wronged us. Instead of focusing on positivity, such as appreciating good health, or appreciating your friends, and most importantly, ourselves. So what has been the most devastating thing that happened recently to all of us? COVID, right? Now, during COVID, it was the study showed by Kaiser Family Foundation that a lot of people were studying was struggling with depression. It was shown that one in 10 adults struggled with depression in 2019. 
but it rose to, 20, but it rose to 4 in 10 adults in 2021, which is a significant rise. I'm not here to talk about COVID, but in these troubling times, we are overwhelmed by negativity and hardships. I firmly believe that we are all trying to pursue positivity in our own terms, and the effect is significant as research so that from Lisa, from uh, John Hopkins, says that those who have a family history of heart disease um, are, are one third less likely to um, have heart attacks who have a positive outlooks. And that includes the way how you think, speak, and act. So fast forward to um, my story, long story short, I went back to school and all the choice that I had to was really keep my head up and pursue positivity. Now, instead of, instead of feeling down, I firmly believe that one day I'll go to America. And, and as I continue to focus and work hard, I'm building a positive mindset. However, that needed some dedication. That required me getting up early 5 a.m. in the morning consistently and building others up by encouraging them with words and building a skill that I wanted to improve. And one day when the opportunity arrived, I was ready to face the hardships. And that meant dealing with hardships in America as life as an immigrant is hard. And I believe that the process of refinement was necessary in order to build that character. So why am I saying these things? It's still a challenge that I need to face every day and a work in progress to say that I have a long way to go. You see, perfection was not what I wanted to achieve, but it was consistency. So how do we apply these in our lives, we ask? Well, let us all try these two things together. I know we are all a big fan of three-point slides and techniques, but I'm here to break that rule and make it two. So the first one is compliment. Compliment others whenever you can. Yes, it's a risk for some, but it is a risk changing the world for the better. The second one is do a random act of kindness. You see, build others up. Leave a note or send a text message to your friend saying that you did a good job or um, how much you appreciate them. You see a change in your life. You'll see a change in your life because you never know what they're going through. And at the same time, you never know that your act of kindness has a tremendous effect on their lives. And I had to break my own rule, but if there was a third point, it's practice. If there's anything I'd like you to take away from tonight, it's this word push. My dad introduced this word to me. Push, persevere until something happens. Push, pray until something happens. And here's what I'd like to add. Push, positivity until something happens. Our final speaker of the evening is Nick Markham. Nick is in his second year at Gordon College, majoring in communication arts and minoring in psychology. And tonight he'll be speaking about calculating route, finding peace when you don't know your life destination. Congratulations, you have arrived. You've successfully entered gordon.edu slash Judd Talks onto your screen. That's such an accomplishment, I know. <laughs> Don't you wish life were just that easy? Don't you wish life was just that straightforward? You know, it's one thing to say that you've arrived at Gordon College as a student, but it's another thing entirely to say that you've landed the perfect dream job and that you're perfectly satisfied and content with it. Most of my life, I've been leading towards a pinpoint up until recently. You see, growing up, I thought I would be a videographer. That's what I thought my destiny would be. I love doing videography. It's my absolute passion. However, now I really don't know what my future is going to hold after college, but I'm okay with that. So we ought to be asking ourselves the question, where should I end up in my career, right? No, that is a terrible question to ask. It is horribly phrased. So instead, Let's try asking a different question. Is it okay? I don't know where my destination is. Yes, it is okay. I don't know where my destination is. So let's take a journey together. Let's take some detours and let's make our internal GPS system mad. Hence the title of my talk, Calculating Route, Finding Peace When You Don't Know Your Life Destination. In the next six to seven minutes, I'm gonna talk about a mindset we've all succumbed to, how faith plays a role in all this, and 
what to look for instead of just your destination. So let's look at this question again. Where should I end up in my career? Why is this such a bad question to ask? Well, what this question is really saying is I need to know where to end up in my career. This is what we've all been subconsciously saying in our minds since the start. Put it, put it this way, for example. You know how everyone uses the word like in their vocabulary in ways that you're not really supposed to? No one taught you how to do that. You grew up that way and you've been exposed to it and therefore it's become a part of your everyday vocabulary. But that's not your fault, is it? Same goes for this. You need to know where you end up in your career. It's not your fault you've been exposed to that in that way. You've most likely been asked on more than one occasion, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do with your major? What are you going to do with your job? Now, of course, this isn't to say that you shouldn't have obtainable, sustainable, achievable, measurable life goals, because goals are important. In fact, without goals, we wouldn't get off the ground that easily. But this is still such a bad question to ask because it assumes that we need to have absolute control of our lives and we need to know completely what our life vision is. And when we try to take control of our lives in this way, it can end up to our roads being a little slippery. No one wants to try to reach their destination on time when there's car crashes and you gotta take detours and the roads are all wet. It's no fun. Now, another factor about this question that is problematic for me and for many is this one particular word in the question. Should. Where should I end up in my career? What should I be doing with my life? What does God want me to do? Now, just a disclaimer here, I'm no theologian. I'm not even minoring in theology. I, I am taking Christian Theo with Dr. Hughes and that's great, but I am not one to tell you what God's will for your life is. That's, that's not my place. However, I'm gonna draw from what I think is a particularly helpful resource. It comes from a Gordon Steelpoint feature article from the spring of 2019 titled, Vocation, Finding Our Place in God's Story, by Jennifer Brink, Sharon Ketchum, and Corey McMillan. Now, vocation in this context can be equated to, let's say, your calling. So the question we're all asking ourselves is, how do we discern our vocation? Well, <clears throat> the Hebrew word avodah emphasizes the inseparability of our work, our worship, and our service. By understanding ourselves and understanding our vocation, we do that by knowing God and seeing how our story plays in the role of the entire biblical narrative. And this plays out by us being able to see God in two different perspectives. The first of which is seeing God as creator and participating in his creative work. Examples of these would be tending a garden, playing music, or even raising children. The second perspective to see God is to see him as redeemer and participating in his redemptive work. And examples of these would be embodying God's love, embracing the stranger, and in general, caring for one another. Now, how do we know what God wants us to do? Well, this is happens through faithfulness and community. By taking time to discern what God wants us to do, we look in faith to him and we find our calling in community. So, as the theologian Todd Boldsinger puts it, vocation is formed and not found. So instead of our, ourselves asking the question on the daily, what is God's calling for my life? Perhaps we can rephrase it like this. What is God doing and how might I participate with others? By reframing the question in this way, we take the focus off of ourselves and instead we put the focus into God. We put our faith and our vision into God and see God as creator and redeemer over our lives. So what can we do with this? Well, perhaps instead of focusing so much on our life destination, perhaps instead we can focus on our life direction. Back in biblical times in the darkness of the night, people would use lanterns in order to get around as that was the only viable light source. Usually during night, people would either carry lanterns or if their hands were full, they would strap lanterns onto their, or little lamps onto their feet so they could walk around while carrying a handful but still see where their steps are taken. In places such as Ephesus, there were little holes carved out into the ground that lanterns would place in to serve as a guide as you're walking through the night, similar to how aisles in a movie theater are illuminated so you can see where you're going. 
Hence Psalm 119, 105, which says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The lights in our life can guide us in the right direction even if we can't see the destination. Imagine if we lived out our life like this in the fullest of this mindset. If you've been on La Vida before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what they're saying is, be here now. Why be so focused on the future worries when you can be so present with your current community? Why be so focused on what your dream job should be when you can be taking advantage of the opportunities around you right now? As we travel the roads of life and you have to take detours, when you take a detour, don't you become much more keenly aware of your surroundings? Isn't it true that you may notice a new pond or business you've ever seen before? If you're so focused on getting to your destination and don't even take a second to look around you, you're going to miss out on so many opportunities that may come your way. So let's look back at the first question once more. Where should I end up in my career? Frankly, I don't ask myself this question anymore. And instead, I ask myself this. What can I do next? By reframing this question in this way, I don't have to be worrying so much about the unknowns of what my future beholds and worrying about that every single moment of my life. Instead, I can just take a lantern, strap a lamp to my feet, take one step at a time, and see if I'm going the right direction, follow the lights, and root my faith in God as creator and redeemer. Of course, we all grow and change, and our mindsets ought to as well. So I would encourage you, examine, reflect, and even reframe some of the mindsets that you have in your own minds. And some practical ways you can do this for starters are to find out how you're doing right now. Write down some work goals and life goals that you have and observe what motivates you and drains you while you're working. These are just a few practical tips, but if you wanna learn more, I highly encourage you to read Designing Your Life by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans, as well as Every Good Endeavor by Timothy Keller. These two books have been very influential in the formation of my own mindsets and in the formation of this presentation. And they have such great practical steps for understanding how to connect your life discernment with what you want to do and how to connect faith with that too. I'll conclude with this, a principle and a quote from Designing Your Life. You are here. It doesn't matter where you come from, where you think you are going, what job or career you have had or you think you should have. You are not too late and you're not too early. Somewhere in some area of your life, you are stuck. You have a wicked problem. And that's a wonderful and exciting place to start. Thank you. What a beautiful speech. Thank you very much, all of the contestants tonight. I want to say special thanks to Ryan Kenister, our uh, manager of the Barrington Center for the Arts, and Nick Malcolm and Alexis Morale for marketing, and CTS staff members who make this event possible and wonderful. So I want to thank to everybody. Also, I want to thank to you for being with us. So what was your favorite speech tonight? What was most inspiring? So please go to the link in the chat room and vote for the People's, uh, Pe People's Choice Award. So simply just click the link and vote your favorite speech. And also, in a minute, there will be a live, uh, live Zoom reception. So during the reception, we're going to announce the winner of the tonight. And also, we're going to have some time to talk with the contestants tonight. So I hope to see you all soon.